Growing up in North Carolina, the local TV station played reruns of the Andy Griffith Show every afternoon. You got to remember the Andy Griffith Show? Still watching. All right. I didn't know if, uh, you know, because it takes place in North Carolina, they only inundated with us there in North Carolina with it. But I watched it. You know, I would finish my homework at 5 o'clock. Episode came on at 5, it was one at 5.30, and I would sit on the couch while my mom was cooking dinner, and I would just be immersed into Mayor. For those of you that may not be familiar with the show, with Andy Griffith's show, it was a sitcom that, that came out uh, in the 1960s. Some of the episodes were black and white, later on they were color. But it was about a sheriff, Andy Taylor, who was the sheriff of a fictional town of Mayberry, North Carolina. And Andy was, well, he was perfect, but I mean, he was a sheriff who walked around without carrying a gun. You know, he didn't have a gun, but then he would solve crimes and solve problems by using his wit, his, his mind, by uh, outthinking people or understanding and listening to people. And he had a way with people and would solve all of these issues by talking or coming up with a plan. His deputy, Marty Fyatt, insisted <laughs> that he had a gun. But remember, he allowed him to carry it, but he had to put the bullet in his pocket, in his shirt pocket. Remember that? Because he was, every time it was loaded, he would end up shooting his foot. <laughs> and I know the crime wasn't uh, all that great in Mayberry. The, the most notorious criminal was the town drunk, Otis, who most of the time walked into the, the police station and locked himself in jail. But Andy was perfect. I mean, he was a single dad in the 1960s, a single parent, and he was the perfect parent. Of course, he had Aunt Kay to help. And he would work things out. It wasn't always crimes or criminals. Sometimes the town would get caught up in some controversy, and he would talk them through it and show them the error of their ways. And he was perfect, a great example. And I watched it every afternoon. Episodes of the Andy Griffith I tried to think about TV shows today, and I couldn't think of TV shows or programs that show someone so perfect, kind of that model of someone that you want to follow or, or be like. But the shows today are different. Not necessarily, I, I don't necessarily think that they're bad. Uh, but they want to deal more with who people really are, and I think they try to tap into the reality of characters to show people's flaws and, and to show how and who they really are, and, and sometimes lessons come from the people's messiness. Andy Taylor was perfect, but that wasn't really reality. The shows today are not perfect, but they're a little closer to reality and how things are. I think back in the, in the 60s, maybe 50s, 60s, and 70s, programs uh, were to kind of teach lessons, moral lessons, and they would do that by having the, the main character to be this outstanding, wonderful person. And there's nothing wrong with that. I learned a lot of lessons watching Andy. And the TV shows today, you know, I, I think of shows like Modern Family, I think they deal with issues and they kind of teach lessons, but they do so through the brokenness and messiness of the people. Just a little secret, I kind of like Modern Family. I know that was maybe taboo for me, but, but I kind of like that show. Maybe not as much as any Griffith. These two shows, 
One that shows this moral figure, a very high moral figure, someone to try to be like and follow. And the other shows are people that are more like us. And I don't know that one is better than the other. I think they're different. And maybe in some ways they are, they both have their values. I think sometimes what we do when we approach Scripture, when we look at the stories and the people within the Bible, I think sometimes we make the mistake of looking at these biblical figures kind of like they're Andy Taylor, like they're perfect without any flaws. Now, of course, Jesus literally is perfect and did not have any flaws. Jesus is Lord and Savior. He is God. And of course we are supposed to follow Jesus. That's what we're all about as Christians, following Christ, living like Christ, and, and following everything that, that He teaches us. That, that is right, true. But when we look at those other characters, or biblical figures, perhaps I should say, they don't come close to the perfection of Jesus. A lot of times we see very real people in the Bible if we dare to open it up and actually read the stories. In fact, what we see, I think, is a mixed bag of people who are sometimes blessings and sometimes just real messy, broken. Sometimes they have good initiatives and good uh, plans and want to do good things and they go about it in not so good ways. Think about Jacob. Can we really lift Jacob up as a moral example to follow and be like? I'm not saying that God didn't like him and that the Bible doesn't favor him, that he has some goodness to him, but can we really say, hey, act like this guy. Here is a man who saw his own brother, his twin brother, basically starving, and he has prepared a stew, which I think was intentional. I think Jacob knew Esau was going to go out and spend time in the wilderness and he was going to come back hungry. And I think Jacob said, what better thing to have for my brother than a nice savory stew that he's going to want to eat. And when Esau comes in, he says, give me some of that red stuff. And Jacob says, that's a fact, brother. How about you give me your birthright? How about you sell me your birthright? Then you can have some soup. Remember how the Bible talks about hospitality and loving your neighbor like yourself? Here is his own brother. And he's holding out the very essence of what he needs to get what he wants. Is this our example of a moral person to follow? Jacob swindles his brother out of his birthright. By the way, the birthright and blessing are two different things. Oh, he cheats his brother out of the blessing too, right? The blessing is what comes from God. The blessing that comes to Abraham and then to Isaac. And then Isaac is going to give it to his son. He wants to give it to Esau, but Jacob slips right in there and tricks his own father. What happened to either of your father and mother? Bearing false witness. I know the Ten Commandments haven't been written yet when the story comes, but is this really our moral character? He takes the blessing. He gets the birthright, which, by the way, the birthright has to do with the inheritance. Today we don't think much about birthright. What does it matter, first or second child? But back then, the first son received a double portion of the inheritance. This is real value. Esau sells it for a bowl of chili. We look at Jacob again. We see that later on, Jacob becomes a person 
who manipulates the livestock market of his own uncle and just about cleans him out. Of course, his uncle has tricked him into marrying both of his daughters. It must have been hard to be family back then with all the trickery going around. We see Jacob also is one who wrestles with God and will not let God go until he gets a blessing. Jacob's name tells us about this, his character. The root in Hebrew for Jacob is also the root that is used to mean heal or cheat. It's really in his head. But that's not all of who Jacob is. The Bible seems to be fond of Jacob. God, we see, likes Jacob. The Bible tells lots and lots of stories. In fact, the book of Genesis, half of Genesis, tells the story of Jacob and his sons. Jacob is born in chapter 25. He's buried in the last chapter, which is chapter 50. Half of Genesis deals with Jacob and his sons. Not a fun. God seems to favor Jacob, kind of likes Jacob. After Jacob has torn his family apart, him and Esau have split up the family over this uh, blessing that has been robbed and taken. Uh, Jacob is on the run for his life, and he goes to lay down and take a nap, and God doesn't come and give him a tongue lashing. God opens up the heavens. And if we see angels, he sees angels descending and ascending up into heavens. The heavens open up and God says, yeah, all of this can be yours. We also see that, that in Jacob, there is this thirst, this hunger, this desire after God. He cheats his brother to get after God and the blessing. And we see this striving of Jacob. There's some good things about Jacob. And, and oh yeah, the way he loves Rachel. Remember what it says? He had to work seven years. But they seemed a short amount of time because he loved her. And then he was willing to work seven more years once he realized he got tricked. Marrying the other sister. Also, Jacob is the one whom the people are named after. Jacob gets a name change when he wrestles with God. God gives him a new name. You will be called Israel. And the people were known as Israelites. Not Abrahamites or Isaacites. And her name comes after Jacob. And his sons become the tribes that build the kingdom. So we find this mixed bag. There is this favoritism of Jacob. There is this, this thirst that he has for God. But he is a cheat and a trickster. And God likes him. And I think that says something about God. I think it says that God has the ability to like and love even us. I think what we begin to see is a God who can work through our messiness. What we find is a God who keeps His promises. God promised blessings, and He keeps those blessings. And Jacob is blessed. So is Esau, by the way. We see God willing to work in a broken world, a world. And we find that God is persistent here. No matter how bad things are, how terrible we can be, God still works. By the way, the gospel passage for this week is the parable of the sower. I 
don't know if you guys read through that this week, but when we read through that parable, what we find is that most of the places where God spreads the seed, the sower spreads the seed, it doesn't work. But there is a place that it does. Because God's Word and His work is going to prevail no matter what. So Jacob, not like Andy Taylor. He's not perfect. But God still works. And God likes it. And God blesses it. And if God, like Jacob, loved Jacob, Work through Jacob. I think that he can do that for you and me. Our biblical characters, our biblical people, are not perfect. They're a mixed bag. Blessing and messiness. And it continues to grow. More people we have, messier it seems to get. I think if we look at the scripture today, if we pay attention to what the message is trying to tell us, is it tells us that sometimes when people are added to the story, it gets really difficult. Look at what the passage says. It says, these are the descendants of Isaac. Isaac, Abraham's son. These are the descendants of the child of promise. Guess what? They start fighting in the womb. You want to know what the descendants are? They're people who are fighting. Rebecca says, I can't believe this. I've waited forever to have a child, and they're going to kill me. She said, I'd rather die. God, what is going on? And God said, I'll tell you. You've got two nations in your womb, and they're fighting with each other. They're always going to fight. That's not my will, but that's just what happens when you get people together. When we get people together, there's conflict. And there's tension. And there's fighting. That's not God's design. Part of the brokenness and the messiness of us as human beings. Jacob and Esau fighted from the beginning. That's who the descendants of the promised child are. Messiness and fight. But not always. They're not always crooked or self-serving. They're not always at each other's throat. There was another time. It happened years and years later. Jacob had been in exile. Because Esau said, the next time I see him, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to put my hand around his neck. Because he tricked me not once, but twice. And Jacob had to leave. Couldn't live with his brother. And after many, many years away, he starts to come back. And both of them have accumulated a lot of wealth. God has blessed both of them. Esau has an army of servants. Jacob's got two wives, a bunch of servants, and a dozen children. Well, a dozen sons. Jacob is coming back. He knows he's going to have to face his brother. His brother wants to kill him. And they finally meet. And it's kind of like a battlefield. And Jacob's spirit.
scared to death. He's a chief, but he's also a coward. Look, you look at the story. He puts everything that he owns between him and his brother. He puts all of his livestock that he swindled out of his uncle. He puts all of his children. He puts his wives, everything that he has between him and his brother. He's last. I think he was thinking that maybe Esau would get tired of slaughtering on all these things, and by the time he got to him, he'd just be worn out and give up. They were expecting to fight. And why else? They were fighting to do it. But something changed. Something had changed in Esau. They got together face to face. And Esau looked at his brother and he didn't put his hands around his neck. I think he threw his arms around his entire body. He said, it's good to see you, brother. I'm glad you're back. I forgive you. Jacob. He can work through the messiness 